before we begin, we're going to pray for him, and then we're going to let him loose. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Oh, Father, I just want to thank you for Jim, and God, I thank Amen. you for his incredible ministry that he's got uh, going on worldwide. And Lord, I want to pray for your anointing and blessing on him today, God, as he has come to share the word that you've placed on his heart. And uh, Lord, thank you for that, God. I just want to ask your blessing on this morning. Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to be here again. Thank you for the prayer. Thank you for the opportunity to come and share the Word of God with you. It's been an exciting year. We've been away for over nine months. And if any of you noticed, I've lost about 40-some-odd pounds. And I'm not looking for it, okay? And if you happen to find it, you keep it, okay? My doctor says that it's good... But he said, you know, that's really great. You've lost 45 pounds. That's really great, but you've got to lose 20 more. <sighs> so I'm going to have to keep moving around while I'm preaching. But we're glad to be with you again today in the name of Jesus. We're glad that this is a mission-minded church, and we're thankful for what God is doing through you and in you and what God wants to continue to do with your lives. You know, today our theme is walking in the light. And I want to show some videos, or not videos, some slides to you about when you're walking in the light, what Jesus can do. You know, I believe Jesus is, we're, we're coming into a day and age where darkness is beginning to overcome, it seems, the truth of Jesus Christ. Even within the church, sometimes darkness is, is beginning to envelop many people within the church, that they're just getting into a feeling of darkness and sadness and, and you know, is it really any hope out there anymore? And I want to say to you today that there is hope out there. And where we walk is depending on how we follow Jesus Christ. And so I want to start off by putting up this first slide because I want these slides to, to come to you and say, okay, this is what God does when we walk in his light and how he provides for us. You know, when we left over a year ago, well, I ran into this Chinese lady over here named Kong Win. I don't know what happened. She's wearing a Canadian shirt, and, but then became a, a Chinese lady. But one of the miracles that took place was this house up there. As we got off the plane, you know, a lot of times what we've been doing over the last number of years, we don't know sometimes what it is we're going to do. We just know the big picture, but sometimes we don't know the details. And that's where you have to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit says to go, then you need to walk in Him and trust that He's going to give you the details. We talked about that even this morning. Next year is already all booked up all the way through, probably until next August. And we know the bigger picture, but Lord, what is the details? And He said, don't worry about it, just trust us. And this was one of them. We didn't know we were going to live when we got off the airplane, but the Holy Spirit about a month before, said, you need to go talk to this guy in Thailand. He's got a house for you. And I thought that was strange. And I said, okay, I'm going to do it, Lord. I, I've learned to walk in your light. I'm learning to, to see that your pathway is being lit. And so when I got there, I went up to this man, and we were only there for a few days. I said, you know, this is a really strange thing that I'm going to ask you. And, and he's not in the, at least I didn't think he was in the business of renting houses. He's our printer. He does the printing of our materials. And I went up to him. I said, the Holy Spirit has so told me that you've got a house for us. Now, can you imagine if I walk up to one of you and said that? But I walked up to him and I said, you know, is, by any chance, is this of God? And he says, you're going to find this hard to believe. But this afternoon, we are finished painting and cleaning up a house and you can move into it tomorrow. And this is the house that you, we used for the next nine months. Isn't that a miracle? How the Holy Spirit leads and said, okay, you can move. And this is the house that we ended up being in and how God provided. The next miracle is this next slide that God did. And there, of course, there's other miracles. But again, as you know, we've been working on this. And God performed a miracle that he gave us a translator that these materials could be translated into Ketchin and Burmese. And one is the dictionary. You've heard about that before. The other one is the principles of faith. And God is opening up another miracle that, that as he gets translated into other languages, people ask me, so what's the big push for next year? Well, we got 20,000 pastors to touch next year. 
And that's a miracle. Both 10,000 in Ketchin and 10,000 in Burmese. And they need these tools. See, we have lots of tools. We can go on the internet. We can go and, and, and uh, go down to the corner store. We, can get, we got television. We got, but they don't. They need. They've never had, can you imagine, never, ever, ever had a concordance or a dictionary for the Bible. They don't even have a theological book. And God has given us the strength to prepare that. And that's what we're going to be doing next year, Lord willing. It's going to cost a lot, about $40,000 to do this ministry to all these pastors. But what, you know, they're hungry. You know, the people, the harvest is ripe, but the labor is a few. But God is raising up laborers over there. I never thought, I was sharing with some of the people this morning, I never thought when I left the streets of St. Thomas as a long-haired hippie, you know, and a drug addict, and my mother was a prostitute and a drunk, that I would be traveling the world as an apostle of Jesus Christ, talking to all these pastors. That's a miracle. That's a miracle. And God continues to do miracles. He, and you know, when you walk in him, when we go to this next slide, another miracle. God raised up all these people that we could go over to Vietnam. We could go into these communist countries, these military countries. You know, at first, it was interesting, the miracle that, that took place, Colwyn was able to get into right away, the country, but they kept me for an hour and a half. I couldn't get through the airport. My wife's on the other side, you know, with all these friends, and they're all smiling, and I'm stuck at the border. And I'm thinking, Lord, I thought it was your will for me to get into Vietnam. And after a period of time, we got into Vietnam. And then we were taken up to the place that we could go and teach and minister to these pastors. And the miracle that took place, we had produced uh, books and Bible information and, and, uh, and servant leadership. And the government, the local government, found out that we were printing these books, and they put a stop on it. And I'm thinking, oh, wow, we've just spent all this money printing on these books, and now the government has put a stop on. And we began to pray, and we say, oh, God, you know, we've done all this work. There's got to be something. And so the leaders, the main leaders of this group that, that gives permission whether books can be printed or not, took our books home and read them. And what they have to do is they read them, and if they feel that they're okay for the people, they have to seal them with a seal, with a government seal saying this is okay for publication. Well, the night before the convention started, we got word that these government officials sealed our books, and now we're not only printing them, we're not having to do it under the table. We're printing them right out in the glorious light of Jesus Christ with the seal of the government of Vietnam that these books are good for the consumption of their people. Hallelujah! That's a miracle. Think about that. Oh, it's going to take a lot of time this morning. I'm frying you guys up. Well, let's go to the next one. See if this next one will work. Here we get an opportunity in Thailand to, to minister to all these young people who are pastoring churches, who are running Bible schools, and we get an opportunity to, to minister to them. And the miracle that comes out of that, out of that came 10 more Bible schools around the world that now we can help with the curriculum and the materials and that in their discipleship training. Can you imagine after just speaking there, there, they're even more challenging to hear. They have a clock, a big clock that sits up and it counts down. And when it gets to zero, you better be shut up or they turn the microphone off. But it was interesting after they got to the end, the miracle that really took place, when they got the 18 minutes, I'm winding up. The leader of the says, said, take 10 more minutes. What you got to share is important. So that's a miracle. <laughs> I've had that even happen in Canada where someone passed me a uh, piece of paper and said, take 10 more minutes. So I'm waiting for that in this service this morning too, okay? <laughs> so if you feel led of the Lord, the Lord is shining on you right on there, take 10 more minutes and make sure an usher gets it to me right away. That would be a miracle, wouldn't it? <laughs> oh, that's good. Oh, keep working on it. But out of that came more pastors, more schools, more, we sent out curriculum to into Pakistan, into other countries around the world. It's amazing what God is doing. You know, when we first started off, as I said, we were walking in the light of the Lord. We knew that God had called us, but then as he revealed. The next slide. Another miracle. Here's another miracle. We go to another meeting where there's over uh, 10,000 people coming together. Now, this is in Myanmar. 
they're under, the, the military is attacking and killing Christians, burning churches, doing all kinds of things, and here they gather together. They said, no matter what the cost, we're going to gather together to worship the Lord, and if the enemy wants to destroy us, that's fine. That's a miracle. Can you think about it? Over 10,000 people would get together. But on top of that, they have a baptism service where, where over 1,039 people get baptized. In the midst of all these challenges, a miracle is taking place. And not only that, I, get, I took a video of this, and young people, do you know what that word viral is? Well, I didn't know. I thought it was some type of disease you get. But I posted this, this video of the baptism on YouTube and also on Facebook, and it went viral. It's just under a million views right now. So if you want to come and shake me a hand afterwards, I'm a viral person. <laughs> Does that make any sense at all? This modern day language just kind of makes me feel weird all of a sudden, you know. But God is, people are hungry, and people were contacting us and said, how can we get baptized? How can we become? Of course, you get also the nasty ones that come along and say, oh, you people are demonic and everything, and you're trying to get people to get baptized and follow this old archaic Jesus Christ. Well, that's good. They don't like it. That's not my problem. That's their problem. When I'm standing up in heaven and waving to them down, you know, where they are, they're going to have a lot of problems at that time. Hey, how's it going down there? No, oh, who's got the last laugh? Hey, no, I won't do that. That won't be showing much mercy. This is Colwyn's mom right here, in case you're wondering. She's 84 years old, still trying to serve the Lord. This is just a great time of celebration. Next slide. Again, walking in the light. More miracles. We were able to do a, a Bible discipleship training school. These are all young people, people who are coming out of the drug scene and so forth and so on. That are, getting, that are getting saved and are wanting to be discipled. Then a door opened up where we could, we could uh, also begin to, to minister and to teach the local churches. Can you imagine? They're in the midst of all kinds of problems, war and everything else, but their vision is we got to do missions too. See, let me tell you, any church that doesn't do missions is out of the will of God. Oh, I don't get a clapping hand for that one. See, God's looking for a church to flow through. And he needs a place to flow through to minister. And so they were getting to see, all these people beginning to see about the importance of ministry. Well, when we got finished the day, we were going to go over. And sometimes God's light is shining off in a peripheral area. Sometimes you don't always see it completely straight on. And so we were walking over there. And while I was walking over there, I saw a young boy fall down in the ground, face right into the ground. And I'm thinking, oh, Lord, and I have been praying, oh, God, I want to be in the book of Mark where it talks about in chapter 16 that not only we go out and preach the gospel, but we'll see miracles, that people will be delivered and people will be healed and even the people will be raised from the dead. Well, I, out of the moment, I, all the pastors are there are in panic, all the other people in panic because now we've got a boy who's face down, he's not breathing, he looks dead. And the Holy Spirit said to me, this is where I'm going to use you again. And I went over and I laid, rolled the boy over, laid hands on him. There was no breath coming from him, nothing. And I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I take authority over what's gone on to this boy. And I pray through the blood of Jesus Christ. And at the moment, as, as soon as I said the blood of Jesus Christ, he opened his eyes, he looked at me and smiled. And he got up and went off and played. He was dead, I believe. And not only that, did he go off and play. I didn't take this picture. Someone else did and posted it on Facebook. I was shocked when I saw this. But to God be the glory. And while he was running away, the Holy Spirit said to me, and because the Holy Spirit said, because of what you've done today, you will see that guy again in heaven. He will come up to you in heaven and thank you for praying for him. Isn't that a miracle? God is doing powerful things. The next slide. Another miracle. We were trying to figure out what to do with the Bible information books. And God opened the door that we could go down and meet people at the Bible Society. Yes, there is a Myanmar Bible Society. But out of that came another guy who is a, going through here to be a dentist, but has the gifting to be able to use a computer and to make apps 
And what is a miracle that's taken place out of that relationship, out of that walking in that light, God now, we have, you can go on your phone and you can get the Bible information in English. You can get it in Burmese, Chinese, Kachin. Soon it's in Spanish and it's also coming up in Filipino language. And you can download this from anywhere in the world and you can have it on your phone. To me, that's a miracle. That's a miracle how God puts things together that when you walk in the light of Jesus, he will open up doors and do powerful things. Again, remember, sometimes where you come from and where God wants to talk you, take you, that's up to him. Can you imagine now this little booklet that we wrote four years ago with a bunch of pastors has now gone out to over a quarter, quarter of a million people and are using it. And, and everything from prisons to jails to, to, to uh, unwed mother places, churches, uh, using it in Sunday school, youth meetings. I couldn't believe how God has performed a miracle. And now it's going out into the millions. Do you know when the Filipino one gets finished, just in the Filipino country alone, there's 55 million Christians there. Just think when they can get that. Isn't that a miracle? Isn't God doing something powerful? The next slide. Again, here's another miracle. This young girl. I'm like, are you getting enough miracles? Had too many or would you like another one? I'm in the city of 7 million people. Okay. We had just gone to the government. We're just we're working at the government office because of my paperwork and that. We decide it's hot. We need to go and have something cold to drink. Now, a year ago, I met this girl indirectly in a teaching in another place in Thailand. So I'm in this restaurant with my wife, Ko Wen, and, and, and it's 7 million people live in this city. And this girl walks into that same restaurant and walks up to me. I don't even remember who she is and says, I know you. And says, you know, you need to come to our church and help disciple there because the majority of the people in their church have converted from Buddhism and need to be discipled in Christ. And this is the miracle. We need you. She didn't know when she got up that morning she would find me, and I didn't, surely didn't think I would find her. But she walked in the restaurant, walked up. Now think about it, 7 million. Think about the odds of that. Somebody walking up to you in 7 million people, huge city, and walk into the exact same restaurant you're in, walk up to you, not realizing, because before when she first met me, I didn't have all this fuzzy stuff on my face, and walk up to me in boldness and said, I know you, and I believe you should come to our church and disciple our people. Isn't that a miracle? <laughs> Next one. Are you getting tired of miracles? Well, we ended up in the Philippines. Also, God had opened up a door. Again, another miracle that God did, we met someone here in Canada who said we need to do the Bible information book in the Philippines. But they didn't end up doing it, so we shared it with Fort McMurray. Fort McMurray ended up doing it, the church there, a lady in the church. Then from there it went to Myanmar. And from Myanmar we met some people that Colwyn knew there, or didn't meet them, actually heard from someone told us about them. And then we ended up in Myanmar, and, it, and, and we found out there was some, a Ketchin lady who was at a university there who was a friend of a Filipino doctor woman, and she would be willing to proofread the Bible information, which she did, completed it in January, so now that it can go back to the printers, and it can go back and become an app. Now, what are the chances of how God can work that all out? Well, God can do it. It's not something we could prepare, could it? You know, that it had to go from here to there, from that country, that country, that country. But see, when you trust God in the light of Jesus Christ, he will perform miracles. And so this is another miracle. Next one, slide. Again, I was praying in the fall. I said, Lord, we had just finished the, 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 the Bible information in Chinese. God had put it into my heart that we should have this book prepared for the house churches in China. And we have been praying, Lord, how do we get it into the house churches in China? Now, sometimes I have a spirit of grumpiness. This is when my wife will say amen. And a few of my friends might say amen too. 
where I get a little bit down, I get a little bit grumpy, and sometimes I complain a little bit. Now, I know none of you are complainers, are you? See, they put these big spotlights on, I can't really see you, but I can hear you. But sometimes I like to complain. I said, Lord, why did you have us do this book? You did a miracle. It had it translated by a bunch of Chinese doctors and professionals. They translated. Now we got this book done. We've got it done now that God had opened up the door that someone in Myanmar could build an app for it so we could get it for the house churches. And Lord, how do we now, what do we do? God says, I'm not through yet. Just keep walking in me. And, and so Christmas time comes around. Of course, North Americans, you know, Christmas is for us, right? To give gifts and for us, you know, to eat a lot of food for us, right? Christmas, you know, don't touch my Christmas time and my New Year's time because this is family times for us. And so, but the Holy Spirit said to you, but I want you to go to a Bible school and teach during this whole time. Or not a Bible school, uh, a Christian school. Because over in that part of the world, they don't have Christmas holidays. They don't even celebrate Christmas Day as a day off or the New Year's Day. So I said, Lord, you know, I've got a little bit of pain in my side. I'd rather just stay home because when we go there, I have to sleep on a little mattress on top of a plywood. There's over 400 kids running around the school screaming and yelling. And, uh, you know, it's just not a place to rest, right? Not a place where you're going to happily cel celebrate Christmas, right? You know, you ever feel selfish sometimes? The woes is me. Anyone get like that? Okay, two people way over there. Anyone else? Oh, yeah, there's a few of you. So as I was going to the woes of me, and I was going to go there, and as, as we got there, we drove up there, and we thought, okay, I, I don't know why I'm here, but, Lord, you're shining a light down that pathway. So, Lord, I just said, okay, if I'm here just to pray, and I will pray for the local church here. I'll pray for the school here. Whatever it is, like even, the, even the leaders came to me and said, why are you here? I said, I really don't know other than the Holy Spirit has shone his light down there because I've been trying to walk in the light of Jesus Christ. And I, and I, and I was there. And next thing you know, that evening they, we had supper. And what came out of the supper are these three people. And I said, so they introduced them. And you know what they said to me? These are three missionaries that are here for this next couple months. And they are missionaries from the house churches. Did you hear that? What was I praying? God, how can we get into the house churches? So not only did we get into a house church, we got the three missionaries that go from church to church to church to church who get into the house churches. And then I show them the, the, the uh, Bible information. And they said, this is really great, but we need you to teach it to us so we can teach it to others. So guess what I was doing Christmas Day? Guess what I was doing the week before Christmas or the week after Christmas to New Year? Teaching them every day how to take this tool so that they could go into their country. And, you know, they have to smuggle it in. They put it on their phones, and they can't use the Internet to download it, so they have to give it from phone to phone to phone to phone. But that's a miracle. God is doing powerful things, and it's going out. Go to the next slide. Another miracle. We were doing this children's book. Some of you helped. And we, we decided we've already printed about 20,000 copies. But God was saying to me again, print some more. But I said, Lord, we don't have money because a lot of the places that we used to get money from have stopped. We got people who are retiring, people who are dying, people, people that used to be big supporters aren't supporting anymore. And so I said, Lord, I don't know how. I don't know why you put this on my heart because there's just no finances for it. But there was about 3,000 that kind of came in, but we needed 10,000. So about a week before, I, I was in a restaurant in Steinbach, and I said, Lord, you know, if this is really of you, you're going to have to do something. Otherwise, we're just going to shelve it and wait for another year. Well, we were in the restaurant having something to eat, and a, a lady and her husband, who I've known for a lot of years, never given to the ministry, nothing. And they said, as we were walking out, they said, come on over, sit down. And the lady said to me, she says, I, I feel I need to ask you, you're trying to do something, aren't you? But you don't have the finances. And I said, yeah, that's true. And, and, and uh, she said, how much do you need yet? I said, I need 7,000 more. She said, last week the Holy Spirit came to me and said, I need to be prepared to write a check for $7,000 and you're him. Now, is that a miracle? <laughs> Not only that, when we go over there, we needed an artist so we could put children's pictures like this. And this artist has painted over 100 pictures for us already. 
so that we can go on. God provided him, and now we're being able to take those pictures and even do more children's ministry. Next slide. Again, the IDP camps, the children's ministries, all the Bible information, here they are, going out into Christian schools, going out into IDP camps, going out into villages, and then we're getting an opportunity to teach and train from the pictures. God is, you know, when you, when you trust him, he's shining a light. But sometimes, where is that light? The next picture. And then we come to, here's an interesting miracle here. In the Labroque Church, they, you know, sometimes when, when, when adults don't do what they're supposed to be doing, God will use children. And here's in the Labroque Church, all year long, this group of children have had a burden for Project Lambs and for Colwyn and the ministry, and they've been praying and praying. And so this year, I had an opportunity to meet them and thank them for their prayers. And you know what they did? They gathered around and laid hands on me in that and prayed that God would continue to do a powerful ministry. God has put a burden on children's heart to be missionaries, to be involved in missions. Amen? We don't want to estimate, underestimate what God is doing. And then, of course, working with the Fellowship of Christian Assemblies, which is another miracle where we can minister and, and touch people's lives through missions across Canada with the children. Another slide. And again, here is another miracle. Here are Gor uh, Gurkha or Gorakha people that have come to Myanmar. They're building a church. They're becoming Christians. They're giving their lives to Christ. And we get a chance. We've been able to help them with this building. Another miracle here. God opened up a door where we can go and teach and train Christian ed leaders from various churches how to teach Sunday school, how to give forth a minute. That's just a miracle. I mean, every one of these is a miracle. I mean, I just feel like jumping out of my skin right now. If God can't do, get you excited, I don't know what else else because we serve a living God today. He's in the business of doing things. But the problem is sometimes we don't see what he's doing. Amen? And that's why sometimes we just need to keep going. Next slide. I think is a lot. Oh, then there, another miracle. Almost forgot this one. Then we come back, and then we end up going to Mexico. Now, last year, I was in a church last year, and we had been doing schools down in Mexico, and I thought they had died because I haven't heard anything about Project Lamb schools in Mexico. And I ran into this guy, and I said, you know, what's happening with Mexico? The schools have died. I haven't heard any more. He said, no, 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 you're so wrong. <laughs> they haven't died. They've actually grown. And not only that, can you come next year and there's a graduation class of 19 students that have graduated from Project Lamps. Not only that, the miracle is, it says, well, and I've never been to this school. This is something that someone else started. I've never had a chance to be there. I mean, even though I'm the director of Project Lambs and the founder, I've never been there. <laughs> I can't get to everywhere. But I go down there, it says, not only that, but there is 102 students that have graduated over the last six years. And now I just got an email. They're starting two more schools in two more cities. That's a miracle. And then they have taken all our courses and translated them into Spanish. That's a miracle. And now those courses are being used in Cuba, Dominican Republic. And just a few weeks ago, I found out that in South America, the majority of the countries in South America are Spanish-speaking. And this pastor talked to me, who is, who is a pastor of 3,000 churches, said, can we use your materials so we can go into these churches and help these 3,000 congregations? Have I said enough yet? Have you got the picture? That when you walk in the light, and of course, when we're down there, uh, Cohen wants to ride a horse. That's a miracle in itself. She's got a cowboy hat on, and she's on a horse. And yes, it wasn't easy. See, sometimes you think when miracles, it's not easy. You know, here, this is our bedroom for the next number of days, a cement floor with a, with a sleeping bag on the floor. You know, my body doesn't like cement floors. You know, the problem with sleeping on cement floors, if you were in pain before you lay down to sleep, you will be in more pain when you wake up in the morning. But sometimes you have to go through the challenges of life so that you can see the miracle of God take place. 
Well, we can stop these slides for now because I want to lead this into talking to you about this whole area about how Psalms chapter 119 verses 105 says, Your word is a light unto my feet and a light unto my path. The Lord put this scripture on me, on my heart, a number of months ago because I'm beginning to see that the church is being engulfed by darkness. There is all kinds of things. Matter of fact, some people, when I talk about miracles today, I can see in your faces that, no, well, that might be for you, but that's not been for us. There's been a lot of darkness that has come upon our family, a lot of darkness that's come upon individual people, upon the children, and upon our, our, our own children, and all those kinds of things. And what's happening, you know, you're beginning to see more darkness than light. Do you know what I'm talking about? But the scripture here talks about the importance of having the light of God's word. You know, when creation was created, God created, God created light. The whole place was in darkness and God created light. And then when we get into the New Testament, that not only did God create light physical, but God now sends the light of Jesus Christ and his word spiritually to us. That's an amazing thing because he knew that we were walking in darkness and that we would need spiritual light. Physical light is nice. And it's interesting how often that we don't want to be any more involved with dark, I mean involved with light. We'd rather have darkness. I remember years ago when I was in, in, in uh, Steinbach, when I first came to Steinbach, you know, uh, Mennonites, where I was working with, they're, they're kind of like Baptists. They like their laws and their rules and their regulations. In fact, at that time, our church was fighting about whether we should have a Christmas tree uh, on our platform or not. That was the big theological discussion, the right of a Christmas tree, okay? And then another theological discussion that we were having at the church at the time, should we use a German hymn book or an English hymn book? Now, some of you may think that was what the problems were. Some of you who go back, long ways back, know exactly what I'm talking about. But what's happened over the years, many other things have come in and many other things have been a challenge and have created darkness. And I've seen a darkness beginning to flood into people's lives and into their homes and into their churches. And, and not only darkness, but people are starting to put on blinders. People will even ask me when I tell them about how the Holy Spirit moves through his gifting, how the Holy Spirit baptizes, how the Holy Spirit fills, how the Holy Spirit does, gives gifts. And people will walk up to me and say, does God still do that? Does God still do that? I thought he did. <laughs> because I serve a God who doesn't change. Amen? How about you? Oh, that doesn't mean that there's not challenges. That doesn't mean that there's not things that we struggle with. But it does mean that God is there wanting to shed forth light. And while I was in Mexico, I was preaching this sermon about the light. And I said dark, because in Mexico, drug trade is coming in. Everything is coming in. People are killing themselves and, and doing all kinds of things to themselves. And, and, and darkness is engulfing the land just like it's engulfing Canada, like it's engulfing, I mean, do you see it, that there's a darkness coming upon the land? Am I the only one that sees it? And sometimes darkness is also radiated through artificial light, light that is really not of God, but it's artificial. See, the world, if they can't get you lined up in the darkness of the world, they will get you lined up with artificial light, believing in something that's not really true, that's not really the light, it's just artificially made. And so while I was down there, I just had take, just got finished saying those words out of my mouth, that this, this area, that what we're entering into darkness, and, and the people, you know, we're, we're struggling, and just as I got that out of my mouth, Five gunshots went off right next door. Four of them went into the air. The fifth one went through the man's head. How dark things must be when somebody wants to take their own life. How darkness, I mean on TV, how many, how many people have committed suicide from the entertainment industry in the last few months? See, what is it that darkness is, is coming upon people so much that they would rather have darkness than light? 
See, it's out there. And that's why this verse, I'm saying, Lord, I want to be a shining light for you. What does that mean? Well, first of all, there's two things that we want to get from this scripture today. One is that when we look at this, that the word of God is a light onto your feet. I got to ask the church here, and I got to ask the church even in this room here, where are you standing today? Because the thing that you need to do is look down at your feet and find out where you're standing. And you may find out that you're not standing on the light of Jesus Christ. You may find out that you've stepped off or you got one foot in, one foot out. You know, most of the churches in North America got one foot in, one foot out. They want enough light to kind of help them, but they want enough darkness to be able to have fun. So when I, was, when I first came, after about five years of being in Steinbach, it was interesting. You couldn't go to movies and you couldn't go to theaters and all those kinds of things. You couldn't play on pool tables. You couldn't use cars. Do you remember that, Herman? Okay. Herman's a little like older like me. He remembers those days. You younger generation have got it easy. You can do pretty well whatever you want. Decorate yourself, whatever, whatever you want to do. But back then, and I found it interesting, you couldn't go to movie theaters, but what you know what the enemy did? He brought out videos. Remember the whole, and next thing you know, Steinbach all turned into video shop here, video shop there. And it was interesting to watch how the church, who wouldn't go to movies, but would rent a video, bring it home, close the curtains on their windows, and watch garbage. You don't remember that? I used to like sitting out in the parking lot watching how many of my church people, especially elders and deacons of my church, go in and rent movies. I remember even when I was younger, because I knew it was a sinful thing, and I'm not picking on movies, you can do whatever you want, but I remember I thought, well, my kids wanted to watch the Fox and the Hound movie. Now, that, some of you young people don't even know what that is. But it's a Walt Disney movie. It was supposed to be, you know, G-rated. It should be safe. So what you do when you want to go do something that maybe the rest of the group doesn't want to do, you sneak off to another city. <laughs> right? And as a good pastor, I'm too well known in Steinbach, so I need to sneak off. So I go to Kenora. And what we did in Kenora, we waited until the movie actually started because it would be dark, right? You've you, you got to learn these tricks. Secondly, you've got to go sit up on the balcony, right? No one ever done that? Okay, well, I did. So I go up, we sneak in the church, we buy, or it was not in the church, <laughs> sneak into the movie theater, got our tickets, snuck up at the balcony, and at that moment, just as it was getting ready to come up on the balcony, something really bright came on the TV. The whole balcony is Steinbeck. <laughs> Hi, Pastor Jim. How you doing? Oh, yeah, we know. Ministry of, that must have been a God, right? Ministry of visitation. Now I can counsel all these people. And I said, just relax. We're going to enjoy the fox and the hound. Let's have a good time and move on from there. But there's things that out there, sometimes artificial light, which tries to give us pleasure when in reality we've got to be walking in the true light. And so sometimes I have to ask, am I standing? Is this the light? Because Jesus tells us that how, how beautiful are the feet of them that bring good news. The feet are important in the Bible. And you need to ask yourself, where am I standing? What am I standing on? And a lot of us don't take time to pray because we're afraid if I see where my feet is, I may have to change. But we're living in a day and age that if you are not standing on the light of Jesus Christ and you're standing on something in the world, you may begin to realize you're going to have a lot of problems. A lot of problems. A lot of problems. People have got off the original vision. People have got off the original call. People have got off what God had originally called them to do, to be something else. And churches can do that too. I was reminded this morning how difficult it was for this church to be birthed forth over those long, long years ago. I was there when it happened. I know the challenges. I know the heartaches. I know the persecution. I know the complaining. I was there sitting in the coffee shop with your pastors. And now you get to rejoice in what God has done, but we're not supposed to stop there. Is that the end of the circle? Is that the end of the vision? Has God got something more for this church? I believe it is yes. 
And so I need to be looking, am I still standing on the calling? Is this church still standing on the calling? Am I still, is the word of God still enlightening my feet? Or am I standing one in and one out? Or am I standing totally on something else that's not of God? And I suspect that in this last day, because of what's going on in North America, more and more Christians are standing on darkness than they are in light. The disadvantage about being in a community for many years, I came here in 1980. I'm shocked at how many people are not going to church anymore. I'm shocked about people who were deacons and elders and people who were worship leaders and all kinds of things that I now meet in Steinbach, and, I, and I'm almost afraid to ask them, what church are you going to now? A lot of because we, we are transit type people. We go from church to church to church looking for some type of spiritual light instead of taking time to look at ourselves and say, where am I standing? Where has God called me? And I'm amazed at how many people are saying to me over and over again, well, we don't go to church anymore. Or we don't even serve. And I mean, these are people that were shouting and praising God and, and going the whole nine yards emotionally and like a, like a football game. Oh, we don't bother. We don't need the church anymore. We don't need to be there on Sunday anymore. To me, when you, as soon as you start saying that, that means you've stepped off the light. You still going to love me? We got to take time. Are we still standing on the light of Jesus Christ? Question number one, and I need to stop here. Question number two, you can see I'm not going to stop. <laughs> but question number two is, is, not only is he a light unto our feet, but he's also a light unto our path. So not only do I got to see where I'm standing, but is he lighting the pathway that I'm walking on? Or am I walking on an artificial light, or am I walking on a pathway of darkness? What pathway am I walking on? And that's what all those miracles were all about. Because the biggest thing that I have to take time in doing is figuring out, am I walking in the will and the pathway of Jesus Christ? And once I discover that, I am, you can't stop me. I'm like a bull in a china cabinet. I don't worry about death. I don't worry about all those things. I just move forward because this is the light of Jesus Christ. This is where he's directing. And that doesn't mean that there won't be suffering and trials and heartaches. I've had them. I've had them and still have them. But my end goal is not here on earth. My end goal is not the light that the world can give. It's the light of Jesus Christ that he gives. My medical doctor asked me this week, or last week, if you were to die today, would there be anything that you would regret or be upset about? I said, no, nothing. It has been a great joy to walk in the light of Jesus Christ since I was 17 years old. And God has been faithful, and he's always been there, and he's always been shining there. I haven't always walked in him. I haven't always been doing what he wanted me to do because I had greater fear of people than I had of God. But now I have a place where I've come where I said, Lord, the only thing I can trust, another few more months, I will be 65 years old. And I was getting, you know, in the North American light would be, oh, you need to retire. I was going to retire and sit on my porch and watch the animals and just relax. And all I, I had, because that's the way my father, you know, everybody gives you a retirement card and everything. You have a retirement party and you retire, right? So I bought into that until someone, a couple of people come up to me. First was my wife and said, you know, can you find the word retirement in the Bible? Nope. My kids said to me, are you going to be happy just sitting down and living in Canada? Nope. You know? God's still giving light. You know, he may give that to some people, and that's what you're called to do, but he's not calling me to do that. His light is shining more. I'm expecting more now. I'm expecting more. That when I come back here a year later, I'm going to have more miracles. This is not the end. I can't just say, well, that was good. We spent a nice nine months, and we don't need to believe God for this anymore. No, his light is still shining forth down various pathways and saying, walk ye in it, walk ye in it, walk in my will, walk, do what I tell you to do. 
yeah, but what about if these people don't do this? And what about if that group doesn't do that? That's not your problem. That's my problem. Walk ye in my light, for I am the light of the world, Jesus said. Amen? So my challenge to you today is, where are you standing? And where are you going? Are you more happier to, to live in darkness than to live in light? You know, a lot of people are. They don't like sermons like this. No, don't do that. You know, I came here to be built up and encouraged. I needed hope today, and you just banged me all up. Well, that's good. Because I don't want you to get up to heaven and then say to me, well, you didn't tell me about this. You held back. No, I'm not holding back today. What light are you standing on? It's time to look. Don't blame other people. Don't get into other people's excuses. Don't say it's their fault. I have a lot of Christians that have said to me over the years, I don't want to be Christian because I grew up in Steinbeck. And you know what Steinbeck is. That, those Mennonites, those German people. You know, give it up already. He didn't ask you to get saved to them. He asked you to get saved to Jesus Christ. Focus on him. Focus on his light. Where are you standing? And then once you've determined where you're standing, ask him through the power of the Holy Spirit to lead you where you should be going. Is God still leading today? I believe God has already told many of you what, where, where you're standing and where you need to change. I believe God is already doing that already in this morning service. And we're going to have prayer time. And it's time to get that right. Quit blaming other people. Quit pointing at other people's light. Look at your own light. Take time right now. Where am I standing? It is, am I standing on the rock of Jesus Christ? Or have I got one foot or one foot out, or am I not standing? And then, what am I doing with my life? Young people, God wants to use you. He is using young people all over the world. He will use you. Well, I don't got this, I don't. Quit listening to the darkness. Quit listening to the artificial light. Get into the word of God, as Psalm says, and see where he would direct you, amen? He wants to use all of you. It's not over yet. The church is small here. Can the church be 1,000? Can the church be 2,000? Can it be 5,000? Can you have a power to touch the whole community in this area for Jesus? My answer is yes. What is your answer? What is your answer? So as we go to prayer, I'm going to challenge you. If you need to rededicate, recommit, whatever it is you need to do, let's gather in prayer. Let's go out of here today saying, I'm still standing in the light of Jesus. There's no turning back. The cross before me. There's no turning back. Amen? God bless you.